Just to quickly review some of the vocabulary we saw back in Gen Chem 1 and some of the, um, the terms and the symbols related to thermodynamics, uh, because we need it for this chapter, let's, let's again review some of the basics that we learned back then. Um, first of all, there is something called the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, it's also called the law of conservation of energy, and it basically says that energy is conserved. Another way of saying it is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And yet another way of saying it is that the energy of the universe is constant. Since the energy of the universe is constant, uh, we know that if something, like our system that we're studying, loses energy, then something else gained exactly that amount of energy. Now, um, there is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine because not all energy is equal. Um, some forms of energy are not usable. So in a process where you are making, for example, electrical energy, you don't necessarily get a hundred percent conversion of whatever process you're using. So some of the energy we might say is lost, but that's actually a bad term in terms of uh, science and chemistry because technically no energy is lost. It's all conserved. Energy stays constant. But when we talk about energy being lost, what we're actually saying is that the energy is converted to a less useful form. For example, the energy might be converted to heat um, that escapes into the room or something along those lines. So energy is conserved. Back in Chem 1, uh, we said that if the energy, um, one of the forms of energy is heat, and if the heat is measured at constant pressure, so Q sub P, Q is our symbol for heat, a little subscript P means we're at constant pressure, then that is um, how we define the enthalpy change, the delta H, for the process. And so enthalpy change is the heat at constant pressure, and we're going to keep it uh, simple in this chapter, and we're always going to be talking about constant pressure changes, so our energy changes are enthalpy changes. Now enthalpy delta H is not exactly the same as delta E, the, the, the energy change which is the heat at constant volume, but we're going to be dealing with constant pressure systems, so we're going to talk about enthalpy. So when I use the word energy, that is synonymous with enthalpy, which is synonymous with heat at constant pressure as we move through this system. We learned back in Chem 1 that if a system absorbs heat, we say that that process is endothermic, and we give the Q a positive numerical sign, so Q would be greater than zero, our delta H would be greater than zero, a positive numerical value. If the system releases heat, we say that that process is exothermic, and Q gets a negative numerical sign, um, so our delta H, our enthalpy change, is a negative numerical value. A typical unit for energy change is kilojoules or joules. We could also use calories, and there are other energy units. Uh, the most common one that we're going to see in this chapter is the joule or the kilojoule. We know from experience that if you put an ice cube on a table, it will melt. All right, there's my ice cube melting, and the water will go everywhere. So ice cube melting on a table out in the classroom is what we consider a spontaneous change. Now this is a term that we did not talk about much in Chem 1, but we want to think about it here as we set up um, the scenarios for this chapter. If something is spontaneous, it happens. It happens without outside intervention. Now in this case, the ice cube does melt on the table, but if I put the same ice cube in a freezer, if I have it in a refrigerator or an ice chest or a cold block, um, a cold storage unit, it will not melt as long as the temperature is low enough. We say that that process then, the ice cube melting under those conditions is non-spontaneous because it won't happen. And so as we um, look at the topics here in this chapter, we want to make sure that we understand the difference between something that is spontaneous and something that is not spontaneous. Another way to look at this term is that in a reaction, I have reactants going to products, a spontaneous process 
would be a process that does produce products and a non-spontaneous process would be a process that leaves you with lots of reactants. That is directly related to the equilibrium constant K that we have just been talking about. If a process is spontaneous, we're talking about an equilibrium constant for that process that is greater than 1. In other words, it's product favored. If you're talking about a non-spontaneous process, a non-spontaneous process leaves you with lots of reactants. You're talking about an equilibrium constant that is less than 1. Notice these are not greater than 0 and less than 0. It's, these are always positive numerical values. And if the equilibrium constant is greater than 1, you have lots of products at equilibrium. If the equilibrium constant is less than 1, you have lots of reactants at equilibrium when the process appears to stop reacting. Notice that this says nothing about how fast or how slow the reaction reaches equilibrium. We have spontaneous processes that are very fast. We also have spontaneous processes that are very, very slow. That's kinetics. That's our rate constant, lowercase k. We have non-spontaneous processes, processes that leave you with lots of reactants at equilibrium that still achieve equilibrium very, very quickly. We also have non-spontaneous processes, processes that leave you with lots of reactants that achieve equilibrium very, very slowly, although there's not much difference in those two since you ultimately end up with lots of reactants.